Good afternoon and welcome to our Biz News Thursday noontime webinar. Uh, you can see for the moment there's just three fellows on the screen, uh, but we do have uh, two um, ladies joining us in a moment, Talita Snakers, uh, who's an author and we'll give you more information on her, and uh, my co-host uh, Linda van Tilburg, who's joining us from London. Uh, they'll, be jo they'll be with us in a little while. Just to let you uh, make sure that everybody is is online and uh, can hear us clearly enough. Maybe I should push that a little bit up. There we go. Otherwise, we'll get lots of uh, complaints, as we do if the sound is not that good. My colleague, Biz News's managing editor Stuart Lohman, is always, as always, is managing things from behind the scenes. Stuart, do you want to just take us through the tech? Excellent. Thanks, Alaric, and welcome all. Uh, just quickly, if you can see those three faces, and there's just under their slideshow presentation with the names of the guests, if you can see that and hear my voice, can you give us a little high five, a little high five button on your panel on the right hand side? Lovely. There they're coming through, Alec. And then, as we do, if you're new to the webinar, we do like to keep them very conversational. Um, there's a little questions drop down menu on the control panel itself on the right hand side. If you put your questions in there, Alec will pass them on to the relevant guest as we go through. But Alec, all over to you. Thanks, Stu. And I see that uh, Linda has indeed joined us now. Uh, just to introduce you to Linda van Tilburg. Um, she is our uh, London correspondent for Biz News and a, um, a long-time journalist in South Africa, well-known uh, for her uh, time. In fact, we worked together on SABC. Sure, feels like three different lifetimes ago, Linda. It's <laughs> no, we, we, don't, we don't admit to anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> not any, definitely not. But uh, we'll be, uh, Linda and I will be picking up the uh, the, the questions as, as they come through, your questions, and I would suggest, as mentioned in the emails uh, during the course of the week, that you get those questions in early. And if you can keep monitoring the questions and, and start jumping in, I'll introduce the two of our three experts uh, who are with us, starting uh, from the left-hand side of the screen, as I see it, with Professor Corne van Welbeek. Uh, Corne, I, I think to a large degree, this webinar came from the conversation we had for our Inside COVID podcast, where you explained that the ban on cigarettes in South Africa didn't seem to be working. Just give us a little bit of background, if you would, on what it is that you do at the University of Cape Town and why this was something that occurred to you. <clears throat> yes, uh, thanks very much, Alec, and it's lovely being on a panel with such a distinguished uh, uh, group of people over here, and thank you very much for all the guests who are part of this. So I'm a professor of economics at the University of Cape Town, uh, so I teach economics, but uh, the other part of my job is to run a research unit called the Research Unit on the Economics of Excisable Products. So we are particularly interested in uh, tobacco control, in uh, alcohol policy, and in uh, sugar sweetened beverages and we take it from a public health perspective so we are independent of the industry we're independent of government and basically we ask questions and we try and look into the academic aspects of these uh, different three uh, products so of course over the past uh, uh, two months the ban on the sale of cigarettes has caused a lot of controversy and what we found is that uh, anecdotally there were lots of comments of people being able to buy cigarettes on the illicit market, that the prices were going up extremely highly uh, and everything else. And uh, we did a survey and the survey we did was from the 29th of April to the 11th of May. So it's becoming already a little bit dated uh, even as we speak. Uh, but we came up with some really, really interesting results. Uh, so we did an online survey. Of course, online surveys have got some bias in the sense that they tend to target somewhat higher uh, than average income um, uh, uh, population. But if we take those uh, uh, problems into consideration, basically we found that from the 12,200 uh, respondents that we received, uh, approximately 16% of them indicated that they had quit during the lockdown. And from a public health perspective, that is a positive outcome. At the same time, though, of the 84% of people who did not quit during the lockdown, uh, we asked a whole lot of questions about the consumption, about the pricing, about brands and all the rest of it. And basically what they uh, told us at that point in time was, on average, the price of cigarettes that they were paying was about 90% more than what they were paying pre-lockdown. Uh, we also saw that there was a major change in the brand composition. 
before the lockdown, approximately 80% of cigarettes were from what we would call the multinational companies, and 20% were from local uh, producers. During the lockdown, the share of the multinational companies' brands decreased to approximately a third, and of course, the share of the local companies had increased to um, about two thirds of the total market. Well, in terms of the retail outlets, before the lockdown, more than 50% of cigarettes were bought in formal retail outlets like the supermarkets and, uh, and so on. After the lockdown, we see that uh, the supermarkets and the formal retail outlets had shrunk to an insignificant number, something like 3% of total cigarettes were bought from them, which was in line with the regulations. So it's very clear that the formal outlets have kept to, more or less, to the regulations. At the same time, though, we see that a whole number of different outlets have been uh, greatly expanded during this particular uh, period. Uh, outlets that have not existed before suddenly come to the fore. Uh, WhatsApp groups, online uh, purchases, uh, buying from friends and family, buying from acquaintances, suddenly become very, very important. Also, a number of people have indicated quite clearly, you now I bought my cigarettes from cigarette smugglers, from drug dealers, etc. something like 4% indicated that they have been purchasing their cigarettes from those types of outlets. So we see that the structure of the market has uh, changed very, very dramatically over this time period. I think I'm going to stop with that uh, for now, Alec. Uh, I think that's uh, to start off with. Good idea. We've already got 10 questions that have come through. Johan van Lochrenberg uh, is well known amongst South Africans for the uh, work that he's done. Two of his books, is, uh, sorry, three of his books are on the screen there. Johan, we've spoken a few times. Uh, the whole rogue saga brought you into the forefront of the consciousness in South Africa. In fact, how many times did you make it to the front page of the Sunday Times during all of that uh, fake news episode? Hi, Alec, and hello to all the participants, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, there were uh, 54 articles over two calendar years. They weren't all front page, but they were all prominent. Wow. And it was all to do with, now with hindsight and certainly reading through your books, uh, that you were getting a little bit too close to criminals. I think it was something that, that had been a long time coming. Uh, I think the revenue service was perhaps considered too independent um, and perhaps a threat to too many different camps and parties who began to uh, coalesce. And, um, you know, if it, if it wasn't that little unit, it would have been something because I think that the, the revenue service was just one more uh, government organ in in the bigger state capture project that had to fall has it surprised you the amount that's come out in the you talk about the state capture project but uh, in the zondo commission and so on the disclosures certainly have shaken many citizens who weren't as close to the action as you have been and but to you no not at all no i, I i'm still waiting for <laughs> the earth shattering stuff um, and I might make an appearance too. Let's see. When are they going to start again? I have no idea. So as, as lockdown, I suppose, is, uh, is one of those things that has put even the Zondo Commission on hold for the moment. But Johan, your latest book on tobacco wars, just take us through the plot, if you like. Well, there's, a, there's, there's the broad plot in as much as how different uh, individuals and groupings uh, involved in the tobacco industry in, in southern Africa to one extent or another over time um, ha battled with the South African Revenue Service and some lost the battles and others uh, maintained the, the battles um, and uh, that, that ultimately culminated in I think the, the sort of primary attack on the revenue service in early 2014, which would then later in that year give uh, rise to the so-called rogue unit uh, story. Um, it wasn't that at first. That, that only came into being towards the latter half of 2014 when these interests um, began to overlap with those of the people involved in, in capturing state entities. 
So that's one one part of the story. The other part um, the other reflects part, on uh, the history of uh, of the tobacco industry the tobacco and its industry peculiar and it's peculiarities it's within it's the South African market, especially this this dynamic that you don't see everywhere in the world, um, but is prominent in South Africa, and that's the so-called big versus small, multinationals versus um, a host of local companies. It's fairly unique, the dynamics um, in South Africa in that respect. And then, of course, you know, I, I elaborate on, on particular um, characters and um, well-known people. Uh, and I, I give insight into why I believe that, you know, not all of them, not all of them are angels, as some of them claim to be. You and I have had this discussion before. Uh, it's a matter of scale and sophistication, and and uh, you know the effects of of, of what they're up to. Um, and so it's a reflection on that. And then you know ultimately I make some predictions, which so far I, I'm happy to say I've been I've been right. Well, we are I think joined by Talita Snakers. Uh, Talita, can you hear us? Alec, I can hear you. For some reason, I can't get my camera to work. So I guess I'm maintaining an element of secrecy um, and I'll, well, I'll hide behind a blank screen for the moment. Well, I, I think uh, the secrecy is now out because I've got a little slide on screen. <laughs> but as Johan was, was, was telling us, and my goodness, the questions are coming through thick and fast. So we're going to be picking up on those in a moment. But Talita, your book, just mm -hmm. give us a, a short synopsis of the plot there. Well, so very briefly, I started doing some work on supply chain security around um, commodities like tobacco, fuel and alcohol. And what really struck me was the extent to which um, big tobacco companies, multinational tobacco companies were involved in the smuggling of tobacco products. Um, and so I started unpacking really how multinationals were getting away with the smuggling of their own products. And around the same time, um, the whole drama at SARS unfolded um, around this supposed rogue unit. And what I saw were really strong parallels between what I had seen internationally um, with the, the multinational tobacco companies were doing and what was happening in South Africa. And so as I unpacked what I had seen both internationally and what we were seeing in South Africa, it became very clear that big tobacco has a playbook. Um, so they control what we think because they control what we read. They control what our politicians do. They control what our law enforcement agencies do. And they're very good at keeping their supply chain almost entirely opaque, which means that even if we do find some of their packs on the black market, it's completely impossible to trace those packs back to them. Um, and that's why they've managed to be so successful um, in terms of supplying the, the black market. Oh, it's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, Linda, I see there are many questions. Do you want to start uh, posing some of those to our panelists? Well, I thought, if you don't mind, I'll just start with Talita, because, you know, there's the court case going on this week. And the, um, today, um, Lamy Zuma actually gave her reasons why mm -hmm. she said there is this ban on the tobacco and she's using some signs that is being questioned by people yeah. again Talita, perhaps just you know tell us what's going on with this latest court case it is by the fair trade independent tobacco association i think that's Johan's former enemies um if i'm right um if you know do you um, Talita, can just apologize tell to you me. about the court case <laughs> Well, so the court case is interesting because it was essentially broken down into two parts. The first part was that FITA wanted government to give reasons for the decision. And then the second part would turn on um, whether the ban itself was actually constitutional and justifiable. So we know that the minister gave reasons and we also know that those reasons are questionable. So when you look at the um, Disaster Management Act, the minister actually has a number of powers and they very specifically, explicitly mention alcohol, but they don't mention tobacco. And what that means is that um, government was essentially exercising a discretion and they were limiting a number of fundamental rights. And you can only do that if you have, um, you know, a rational reason to do so. And also 
if your objectives are actually um, you know relevant um, and directly related to the um, to the way in which you are curbing rights and I think when we look at the reasons that the minister has advanced um, I think they would fail to pass constitutional muster and I think they almost certainly would fail to pass um, you know administrative um, juris administrative discretion um, muster if it, if it did go to court what I just saw before we came on air is that um, the office of the president has apparently indicated that the sale of cigarettes will be allowed um, once we get to level two, uh, you know, which might which might make um, the FITA court case moot. But I do think there are there are real implications in terms of um, how government exercises discretions and how government exercises um, powers under the Disaster Management Act. That's Quite interesting. Pick... I'm just having a look here. The... She also says the reason that she suspects there's a direct link between severe COVID-19 and smoking. That's probably one, apparently one of the yeah. reasons. Yeah. Linked to that, yeah. a question from Delita. Bat withdrew their court action. This is a question from. I'm just going to see who's that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you now who it is. Oh, was, yeah. um, to engage with the government, and that obviously didn't work. Yeah. So why do you think it's being asked? Are they not interested in taking the matter to court? Now, given that they obviously have a strong and easy case, it seems to argue. Well, that's a matter of some speculation. So I'll give you my take on it. Um, I think for many of us, um, it's been a bit of a mystery why BAC would walk away from it. To my mind, there are a number of factors that play potentially play into that. The first one is that Bat has historically had a fairly close relationship with government. Um, and so, you, you know, and we know that they are very good at using door openers and then we know that they're very good at using corporate spin. And so it might simply be a case of, you know, old allies agreeing not to be too litigious with each other. But I also suspect that part of it might be that that realizes that it could potentially be on the back foot. Um, we know that the bat factory was raided two weeks ago. Uh, we know that bat is um, facing some challenges um, from SARS in terms of both income tax and customs evasion. And so perhaps bat realized that taking government to court might potentially expose um, some of its dirty dealings. But as I say, this is pure speculation on my part. Um, I don't think any of us really know for sure why the uh, why they let their court case go. Why the Linda, was a question from here, what Linda, length? Linda yeah. can I just pick yeah. up here, please, with a question from Tim Elliott. He says, with so much information in the public domain about the illicit or illegal tobacco trade, why has no action been taken through the justice system, i.e. police, SIU, NPA? Johan, you want to have a go at that and also perhaps some of the questions that Linda posed uh, to Talita? Yeah, sure. I mean, the answer to the, the first question is pretty simple. Um, so we live in, in, in a developing state um, with, a, with a particular history. And so first and foremost, uh, in 1994, when we um, uh, became the first, uh, uh, you know, for a proper democracy, um, what was inherited was a, 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 a securocrat um, criminal justice system that was designed to suppress people and 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 so forth. So, um, it, to that extent, you know what what came about was um, seedlings of um, the ideal uh, future criminal justice system, and to an extent, other parts of government that that, that participate in that. Um, so it was by, by no means perfect, but they were wonderful stories. So things like the Financial Intelligence Center uh, came out of nowhere. We uh, had the, a wonderful, the wonderful story of the Asset Forfeiture Unit, the Special Investigations Unit, and to an extent the Revenue Service um, and, and, and also the Old Scorpions. Um, and then politics, uh, you know, kicked in and, 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 and politicians became um, or felt victimized and so on, and it just became very messy. And ultimately, state capture um, came in on a, on a much larger scale. And you know, we're now living with the lag effect and the consequences of that. They couldn't cope before lockdown. They certainly not coping during lockdown. 
I don't think we should expect too much from from uh, you know this broken system. Um, in respect of the court case uh, ongoing, I've read the papers in terms of the application. I think uh, Talita summed it up pretty well. The essence is that um, the the local manufacturers in South Africa that form part of this body that's bringing the the the, the matter before court um, is 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 challenging the the manner in which the the, the 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 ban in the trade of cigarettes um, came about. So it's a, a challenge on process and the rationale and logic and reasons why there's this ban. That's that's you know to sum it up in simple terms. Um, I think you know it's unfortunate that we have to get to court in order to uh, now as citizens see the reasons why our government imposed um, prohibitive legislation on us. Uh, we didn't see that with the Spaza shop negotiations, if, you know, when lockdown started, and we didn't see that with the taxi industry negotiation. So that's, a, you know, it's an interesting uh, dynamic because the approach by government towards the tobacco industry is completely different. Um, th there seems to be no appetite to seek midway. Um, and ultimately, I think it's going to be a question of you know, to what extent? It's certainly a matter of national importance. It's 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 for me a pity that it concerns cigarettes, um, but it so happens to be cigarettes now. That's you know that's that's brought us to this point. We we're at a place where we've never been before in in our new constitutional democracy, and whatever the outcome may be, it should be a win for us because it'll give us clarity. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on the merits and so on. I just think it's unfortunate that now that the reasons have come, that you know, if there were good reasons, why didn't they just give them to us, you know, up front? And maybe we, you know, there would have been no need to to go to court. Maybe we would have supported government in the ban. Uh, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what what I'll I'll say in respect of that. Brilliant. We're going to be going to questions, and Linda, I'm sure you're reading through them there because there are many that are available. But uh, I, I'd, I'd like to just throw the ball to you, Corne. Uh, because there is a question here from Roy Harrington who says, how much tax did the government lose since the lockdown period? I know you've done the research on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, the government aims to collect approximately 14 billion rands per year from uh, tobacco taxes. Uh, so you can work it out that's in the order of about 1.1 to 1.2 billion cigarettes, uh, excuse me, billion rand per month. Uh, that the government aims to get. There is a fair amount of seasonality in how that money comes in. Uh, and typically we find that at the beginning of the financial year, you tend to find that the amount of money that the government collects is somewhat less than what it collects towards the end of the financial year, simply because they try and front load uh, the payment of the excise taxes. But if I were to take a guess, I would say that uh, we can work on approximately a billion rand being lost per month uh, for the period that the lockdown is in place. If one looks at that from a uh, sort of a global government perspective, uh, tobacco taxes comprise approximately 1% of total government uh, income. It's not nothing, uh, but it's also not that the economy turns around the tobacco industry as is sometimes being proposed by the tobacco industry itself. Linda? Question here, I don't know, it was said, where is Mr. Rupert? Well, implying that, you know, they have a large share in in BAT. I don't know if anybody can answer that. Well, BAT is a public company. Um, you know, people own shares. I, I happen to uh, indirectly have shares in BAT through my um, retirement annuity, and I'm having a devil of a time to get rid of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's essentially it's on it's 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 actually duly listed on the London Stock Exchange and uh, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and it's got a market cap of uh, around 1.7 trillion rand, which is more than the annual revenue take of the country. Um, and uh, yeah, so I I do know that the that the public investment corporation Telita can just help me with the numbers, but somewhere around uh, 30 billion rand uh, in, in, in shares held um, by the PIC. Yes, yeah. tobacco ban question. 
Sorry, Absolutely. Linda, let's just let, let Talita answer that one, if you don't mind. Okay. Talita? Well, Johan was actually spot on. So it's 29.2 billion rand of our pension funds that are sitting in um, BAT. But why why this focus on Johan Rupert? Uh, his involvement in BAT surely is it's so remote now and so small uh, that mm. why would he be personified as the a person who is controlling or pulling the strings at bat, it, it seems the last thing in the world that he'd want to be doing. Well, well, look, I mean, if you go way back to um, the 1940s, um, Anton Rupert back then um, decided to start getting into the manufacturing of tobacco. So he invested 10 pounds um, and started the Rembrandt Group. Um, and then in 1988, his Rembrandt Group effectively became Richemont, right? Um, so his 10 pounds investment turned into 10 billion. Um, and then um, Rembrandt and Richemont ended up consolidating their tobacco interests into Rothmans International. And when that happened at the time, they were controlling 93% of the legal tobacco market in South Africa. And that in the end was ceded to British American tobacco. So perhaps it's kind of a long winded way of answering uh, what Mr. Rupert has to do with it. Yeah, I can, I can just add, if I may, Alec, that um, uh, Delita is absolutely correct. It, 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 it's got a particular history. Um, and uh, I'm assuming, uh, you know, the nature of your show is such that I'm assuming most people will understand the difference between a multinational and a, a locally owned business entity. They structured, BAT is actually a worldwide group. They've got uh, over 50 different um, uh, BATs in, in different parts of the world, in different countries, and another, I think, 122 um, linked entities and and different structures of ownership and, and shareholdings and so forth. And um, the only thing I'll add to that is that the 10 pound business that started was was actually named Voorbrand. Um, yeah, it was somewhere in the 1940s. And I, I think it's, it's perhaps, you know, um, uh, the Rupert family, or or, or 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 Mr. Rupert, or whatever. Perhaps he, he he's one of the you know big individuals that hold shares in in BAT, and because of the you know the family relations. But um, BAT is owned by shareholders, and you know depending on which BAT you look at, because there's a what I call the mother the mothership uh, BAT PLC based in London that pretty much control this worldwide network. They don't manufacture cigarettes at all. Um, and they haven't paid uh, much income tax in in the UK for many years. And in fact, they pay a ridiculous amount. And I think Delita can speak to that. But they hold things like the patents and the trademarks and the agency agreements and so forth. And South Africa is just one of the BATs uh, worldwide. If anybody's going to survive a lockdown of um, of any kind and a ban that comes with that, it's going to be companies like BAT because they can survive by cross subsidization or, you know, they, they certainly, the worst that can happen to them is that they have to shut down their factory in, in Heidelberg. But um, BAT won't go away because, um, you know, because government, uh, uh, temporarily bans the the, the trade and, and 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 sale of cigarettes. Let's, um, let's get it's to, our local get, it's our local guys that'll disappear, and that's my concern. Mm. Is that let's get to the, the nub of Johan the nub of Antelita and and Corne, which is people are still smoking. Government mm. is not getting its excise duties. Cigarette packs are selling for more than they were before. And clearly, somebody is pocketing a lot of money and a lot of profit. And I'd love to hear your views, the three of you, because that's the question that most people in the public have. Why has this been allowed? Pune, you want to just start off? So if I can start. So uh, in our survey, we asked people, how much did you smoke during the lockdown relative to before the lockdown? And most of the people indicated that they smoked somewhat less during the lockdown. Uh, simply because of uh, it's becoming so very expensive. But that wasn't all that much. It was about a 10% reduction in uh, average consumption per person from before the lockdown till um, uh, during the lockdown. 
Um, if one looks at the volume of cigarettes that have been sold, uh, at least during the time when we did our survey, uh, those volumes are very, very substantial. Uh, so the question that one needs to ask is, where did those cigarettes come, uh, come from? Were they imported? Were they illicitly imported? Did they come from bonded warehouses where they had been declared before the time and they were sort of leaked into the market? Were they being manufactured illicitly, uh, even during level five lockdown? Those are the kind of questions that I think we should be asking to the tobacco companies and uh, getting uh, and getting answers from, from them because uh, clearly uh, many smokers are desperate and I sympathize with the smokers, I, I really do. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is a market for cigarettes out there. Uh, the prices are skyrocketing on a daily basis. During our survey, we found that the prices were increasing by 4.4% per day uh, during that time period. And we have every reason to believe that past our survey period, the prices have been increasing even more. Um, so clearly someone is making a lot of money. I suspect that uh, the retailers and uh, the wholesalers might be also pocketing additional money. Uh, but uh, most of the money, I suspect, and it's, it's a suspicion, is that going to the, uh, the companies themselves that are somehow in a position to be able to bring that uh, product onto the market. I don't know. I think Johan might have some other thoughts as well. What do you think, Talita, of what the prof has just said? Well, I, I think he's he's absolutely right. So to my mind, there are only three possible sources, very broadly speaking. The first one is, it, you know, it could be manufactured locally. The second one is it could be being imported um, from a country like Zimbabwe. And the third one is um, someone could be telling us that they are exporting the packs, but in fact, um, the packs are being sold on the local market. And I think there's some data that's quite interesting. So um, if we look at um, most of our um, unmanufactured tobacco and some of our cigarettes come from Zimbabwe, right? So um, when you look at the cigarettes that are being exported from Zimbabwe, only 15% of the cigarettes that are exported from Zimbabwe are declared for import in South Africa. That means 85% of the cigarettes that leave Zimbabwe for South Africa are never declared on this side of the border as being imported. Um, we have a similar situation when it comes to um, cigarettes that are ostensibly being exported. So, you know, BAT itself tells us that they export to 22 countries. Um, and we also know that they control, let's say, 75% of the local market. When we look at the cigarettes that are being declared for export from South Africa, 66% um, of those exports don't get to where they were supposed to go. So somewhere along the supply line, they are being diverted. And my guess is that the 66% is being diverted back into the South African market. So they're actually just not being exported at all. Wow. This is a very, very dangerous, dirty area, it appears. Johan, do you want to just uh, give your thoughts there? Because many people are saying, because Azana Dlamini Zuma has got a vested interest, they're blaming her for all yeah. of this, but from the way it's been unpacked so far, it's much more complex. Yeah, but all the memes that I've seen on the internet it always points to her, but you know, it's like you said about you know, oh, yeah, finding I mean, her on Rupert and just blaming him for everything. So I would like to know that too. Yeah, Alec, I mean, let me, let me just say this, you know, I think um, uh, Talita's book should be read by, by as many people as possible because it gives a complete world picture over a very long period in time of the tobacco industry. Um, it, is, it, is, it is truly an industry of smoke and mirrors. So the one thing I would caution everybody um, who, who has an interest in the topic, um, whether you're a smoker or not, um, just be very, very careful that you do not play into one or other, um, you know, game that's going on. There is always some sort of relationship between politics, governments, and governance, and the cigarette industry. Make no mistake, it's as old as the cigarette industry, and I think Delita makes that point very um, uh, clear in her book. Um, so, 
I would not want to speculate at all. I, and I would advise people to stop doing that because it's not helpful if you want to understand what's going on and if you want some kind of a, 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 you know, um, finality on the issue. Um, ad hominem kind of speculations and, you know, trying to link people with other people uh, without the factual basis is not a good thing. Um, we, we should know this as South Africans. That's precisely what the state capture people did to us. So let's not also uh, promote that. Now, I mean, the topic here is why, why the ban in South Africa? Um, I think there's partly a history to it. It has to do with, um, you know, there's a general, uh, there has been a general move towards uh, anti-smoking sentiment. Uh, Gordon Ray can tell us more about that for the last 20 to 25 years. Delito explains it very nicely in a book around the World Health uh, uh, Protocols. And in that sense, um, when Minister Dlamini Zuma was the Minister of Health, she was complimented and recognized as one of the um, sort of pathfinders in implementing anti-smoking protocols um, through legislation in South Africa. And we were lauded for that. We were considered to be far ahead of uh, many of the developed world when it, when it came to uh, a sort of anti-smoking type um, legal framework. Um, coming back to the ban, uh, it seems to me based on you know what's come out um, in the last day or two in respect of why there's this ban, it has to do with that, you know, the sort of an anti-smoking reasons. So the only concern I have there is that um, there is that our government may be using the pandemic and the regulatory framework um, that comes with a, a state of emergency um, to achieve a sort of broader policy, um, um, uh, uh, you know, outcome, which I think would be problematic. I think for you know, from a legal perspective, um, don't be opportunistic during a time of crisis to try and get us to stop smoking. You know, that's, that's not how it works. Um, where, where do these cigarettes come from that are in the underground market? Because I don't like the term uh, black market. Um, they come from, they come from uh, cigarette factories. Um, most of them come from cigarette factories in South Africa or our neighboring states. I always say that the brands tell a story. So it depends. If you can show me the pack of cigarettes, then uh, I can look at that pack of cigarettes and then I'll be able to tell you if it's old stock, new stock, counterfeit stock. But ultimately, it can only come from two places, and that is either a legitimate registered uh, tobacco manufacturer in South Africa or elsewhere, or one of these so-called underground uh, manufacturers of which we've seen in the past a few of. Um, these are these machines that operate in sort of abandoned warehouses or uh, you know, underground and so forth. And then there are multiple people along the value chain from the point where they leave the, the factory right up until the point where they end up in the hands of a smoker. Now, excise tax, which is the largest portion of um, loss to the government and which is the largest portion of the cost of a pack of cigarettes, um, in South Africa, somewhere around, Kornai, what, 17 rand? Uh, 17 rand and a bit, yes. 17, 17 rand, rand and something. Okay, so that's, and then it costs some, somewhere anything between one rand 50 to three rand to manufacture a box, and everything else is then cost plus profit. So what's happening now is that everybody um, from the worst possible criminal gang um, that you can imagine, to the worst possible transnational uh, organized crime syndicate, to your innocent mom and pop entrepreneur, to your spaza shop, everybody's in on this game because there's a demand of around 7 million people who are hooked to this thing and they can't get their fix. So they're just running around and everybody, it's wild west out there. But uh, excise tax itself is, is very similar to um, a value added tax. So the taxes get theoretically get paid at the point of manufacture. Um, and then that gets passed along the, the sort of um, 
the, the wholesale and retail chain right up until the user. So effectively, what you're looking at now is you're either looking at old stock or illegally manufactured stock, either within legitimate manufacture, uh, legitimate uh, uh, companies or uh, underground um, uh, factories. And, the, you know, then there are different scams, like Talita alluded to and, and Cornet alluded to, like, you know, now suddenly they can all manufacture for export. So I can guarantee you, and I hope that our revenue service has now, you know, put their people uh, on alert at the ports of entry and, 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 and the police and the army at the border post, because whatever is going to be exported, a hell of a lot of that's going to just simply be round trip or ghost export. So, but it really depends. You've got to show me the pack and then I'll tell you. And the last comment I'll make, Alex, sorry, I'm taking very long. Um, is that I have seen new brands uh, that I've never really seen before on scale or in some cases at all that are suddenly available in South Africa. Now, that's purely, that, they've been smuggled in. It's as simple as that. What's the link? There's a question here from Martin Ari. What's the link between Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma and Mazotti? I see that she's denied that he's a friend. Do in any of the three of you know? I don't answer that question yeah, because it's all over. The room is all over. Delita, we've both spoken to him, so you can you can take this one. I'll, if if, I, if right. there's something to add, I'll add. <laughs> I'll I'll take this one. So, um, when I spoke to Adriana Mozotti, the one thing that struck me was that um, his political conscience goes back many decades. So when he was a teenager he became politically active and started supporting um, political organizations that he thought represented a fair and de democratic society. And so um, he has been making donations to political parties and he's been very open about the fact that he has made donations to political parties. So both to um, Mrs. Lamini Zuma and to um, Julius Malema. Um, you know, he's made the point that to date his association with someone like Malema hasn't actually, you know, brought him any benefit. Uh, quite to the contrary, it's actually perhaps been to his detriment. Um, but I think we should be careful to reading too much into somebody making a political donation and immediately assuming that there is some nefarious purpose behind it. But I think what we also need to understand is that throughout the tobacco industry, all of the companies have some kind of political patronage. They all have somebody, um, you know, who who covers them and who gives them uh, political coverage. Um, and every single one of the tobacco companies in the country, um, that would be true for. So why we are singling out uh, Mr. Mazzotti, I, I think is unfair to the extent that other companies are not being as frank, frank and open about who their political patrons are. Linda, I'm well, sure you've been planning I'll, all those I'll questions. Add a different dynamic to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. please do. Sorry. Um, look, um, it, it, it's no secret that uh, um, not not Mazzotti, by the way, it's actually another director of Carney Link. Um, lend money to uh, the, the, the CIC of the economic freedom fighters um, uh, in order to enable him to repay a portion of his tax bill that was outstanding. That, that, that's no secret, it's, it's, it's public knowledge. It's no secret that Carney Links, the company, um, donated a portion of the registration fees for the EFF uh, at the time when they participated in the first elections um, in, in, in 2014. Uh, it's no secret that um, uh, mem some members of the command of the EFF, in particular uh, the CIC, Mr. Malema, and uh, in particular Mr. Mazzotti, and to an extent, some of the other directors um, are friends. Um, they, they are actually neighbors. Um, it's also no secret uh, that 
Um, during the run-up to the NC uh, presidential, uh, the latest NC presidential elections, where Dr. Lamini Zuma um, participated as a contender, that um, uh, Mr. Mazzotti uh, somehow managed to have a number of meetings with her, um, but she and he should explain how those meetings came about. She seemed to, at a point, um, not want to um, <coughs> go into too much detail. And she acknowledged one such meeting. And then it turned out through a journalist from Ziwa Africa that, in fact, there were more meetings because there were photographs of more of these meetings. Um, he certainly told me they're not friends. Um, you know, he, 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 entrepreneurs do what, 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 what Carnelinks do. Um, and it's not unique to Carnelinks. Um, and uh, yeah, they're not friends. And he ultimately facilitated the, the so-called NDZ campaign to um, to obtain, uh, you know, the branded paraphernalia, caps and T-shirts and that sort of thing. And I think that's where this all comes from. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got doctor, because she is a doctor, um, and you've got a history um, where she is openly and has always been openly opposed to smoking. She's been advancing the anti-smoking uh, framework within the uh, legal context in the country. And then there were those interactions with her and Mazzotti and, the, and then the paraphernalia that went to the NDZ campaign. Uh, and then there's the association with the EFF and you know, within the broader context, there's this theory that says a certain portion of the EF, uh, of the ANC and the EFF are closer aligned than another portion of uh, of the ANC. You know, this sort of factional theory, um, and that's basically the origin, I believe, of of these stories. And again, I said maybe so, it may not be so, but it's not going to help us to advance the. the this, this particular debate. Um, yeah, Alex, but that's where it, it comes from. To me, it seems to me that politicians and and uh, makers of uh, products that are heavily duty or heavy excise duty should not be friends. But anyway, that's maybe a purist idea. Linda, have you got a question that you've picked up? There are some people who, who seem to be pro the ban because of the medical advantages of that there was mark rontry said is the science in dispute is this what it's about or is it you know is, is it not about the science my, I was... Again, um, I think my, my point is simple okay, simply sorry. that um... mm -hmm. let's give corner a chance okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. so in, in terms of that um uh, i think that the medical science uh, uh it can be argued both ways. So there have been a number of studies that have suggested that uh, being a smoker makes uh, COVID-19 worse as a symptom. But at the same time, there have also been some studies that suggest that it might be actually giving some form of protection, having nicotine uh, in your body, in providing some form of, of uh, protection. So the point is that from a medical point of view, uh, the case is clearly not one either way. Uh, it's, it's not obvious. That doesn't mean to say that we should all start smoking to protect us from COVID-19. Nobody is saying that in the medical community. But at the same time, um, it's not as obvious uh, from a medical perspective as what um, uh, the link is, for instance, between lung cancer and smoking. Um, my, uh, our research findings suggest very clearly that uh, if one just looks at the economic implications, this thing is not working. We are not passing a comment about what was the rationale and what was the effectiveness of the initial lockdown. Uh, I think one could argue quite strongly that the initial uh, ban on sale of cigarettes for the first three weeks, even the first five weeks, was probably uh, a good thing. And it was a good thing from a public health perspective, also because we did not know what the public health impact was of COVID-19 on smokers. Uh, there's been a lot of research that has been done over the past eight or so weeks that uh, are coming with some at least provisional and some uh, uh, sort of um, uh, yeah initial results that we had not known eight weeks ago. So I think the government was correct in taking the precautionary approach 
by banning the sale of cigarettes on the assumption at that point in time quite reasonable that people who smoke cigarettes are more likely to get COVID-19 and get worse forms of it. Um, the fact of the matter is that economically this thing is just not working and uh, if so many people are buying cigarettes it's entrenching a illicit market deep into our system and if I can just quickly talk about illicit trade in South Africa long before uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis took hold uh, we reckon according to our research that at least 25 percent of the uh, of the cigarette market in South Africa was illicit it was probably in the order of between and 35% in 2017 and 2018. It probably came down by about uh, six to eight percentage points in 2019 as a result of good work done by South African Revenue Services. Uh, the issue is that South Africa does have an illicit trade problem irrespective of the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happening now is that the illicit market is becoming increasingly well established. They're learning new tricks and uh, many people are uh, able to buy cigarettes uh, at this moment in time at very high prices but after the um, lockdown and after the ban is over we presume that there's going to be very very significant price wars between on the one hand the multinationals and on the other hand the local manufacturers as the multinationals are going to try and try and uh, claw back some of the losses that they incurred during this period. So Lita? Um, yeah you know I um... I agree with Corneille in the sense that whether it was originally, you know, well intentioned and whether it was originally justifiable has become a moot point because the damage has simply become too big. And one of my fears when you look at a behavioral psychology um, perspective is I think so many South Africans have become disenchanted with government and feel disenfranchised um, in so many respects. And I think in the longer term, one of the fears is that this will um, be one way for um, for South Africans to express their dissatisfaction with government. So they feel powerless and one of the ways in which they can regain some element of control is by continuing to support the illicit market even after the ban has been lifted. So it has the potential, I fear, to become something of a tax revolt. Um, where people simply don't want to buy legitimate cigarettes anymore for the very simple reason that it's, it's, it's a simple way to express their dissatisfaction with government. Deep stuff. Johan, uh, not such a deep question from Greg Beach. He wants to know, you're apparently a smoker. How are you managing uh, in the lockdown or have you stopped? Uh, no, I, I, no, 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 no. I, I, I used to. And that's why I always say I can understand the you know the the consequence of telling somebody you've got to stop now against your will i i have absolute absolute empathy and sympathy and it's very difficult um you know it's something else if you prepare in your mind that you know you're going to quit and you you know you you read the book that i read on how to quit and so on. um so that's yeah I, I loved what you said there, Talita, because the, the reality of the situation is that honest people, law-abiding citizens that I know who smoke, are now breaking the law because they say it's a dumb, it's a stupid law. And if you start getting people saying these are stupid laws, you don't know where it's going to end up. Uh, but Linda, I'm sure you've got one uh, last question because we are coming to the end of our hour. People, people wanted to know how does it affect the vaping industry. Mm. Yeah, so, it, 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 it includes it, it, the regulation reads uh, uh, tobacco products or, and related products, so it includes vaping. Mm -hmm. It it does include vaping. One of my concerns is, you know, we know until well into the ban, um, some of the multinational companies were still shipping their products. In fact, you could order them from Diskem and have them delivered at your home. And when we look at the activities that the government are proclaiming, that the police are posting on social media about their successes and people being arrested, um, we never hear anything about the enforcement of vaping. Um, I think something like 9% uh, of South Africans have actually started vaping. Cornet might have some, some data on that. But one of my concerns is that aspects around vaping are going under the radar simply because we're so focused on cigarettes 
that we forget to look at things like bulk tobacco. Um, we forget to look at things like vaping. And I fear that that is precisely where the illicit, the legitimate, illegitimate market is likely to grow because it's not where we focus our attention. We coming to the end of our program and I'd love each of you just to have a, a final go at, at this question. An expert panel of World Health Organizations, this is from Yusuf Salaji, uh, concluded that smoking increases the severity of the disease in people infected with coronavirus. Studies in the New England Journal of Medicine and, 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 he goes on. Allowing smoking will increase the demand for ICU facilities and ventilators and overwhelm the health services. So it is another side of the coin. Uh, Corne, your thoughts on that as uh, you wrap up with your final comments? Yeah, thanks very much and thanks to that question from Yusuf. Um, in terms of uh, what Yusuf is saying, we are not disputing that. In terms of the practicality of how do we uh, actually enforce a effective ban on smoking, that is where the rub comes in. It's not a case that we are in disagreement with the WHO report. Uh, what we are just saying is the uh, medical evidence might be as strong as what it is. At the same time, though, we have an economic reality. And the economic and the real life reality is that people are smoking cigarettes. To the extent that the government can curb the illicit uh, trade in cigarettes, that is great. But they're not. And at this moment in time, you hear normal people, uh, middle class people, being able to buy cigarettes, admittedly at very, very high prices, uh, and, and they are continuing smoking. Also, the other thing that I'd just like to point out is that um, the Minister of Health indicated that the sharing of cigarettes is a problem and it's going to um, help to spread the virus. If cigarettes are becoming so expensive that uh, people have to pay 10, 15, 20 rand for a cigarette, those cigarettes are going to be smoked to the very, very end. They're not going to be thrown away. And they're going to be smoked by people who pick them up, the stompies, and they're going to start smoking from them. And that's a problem. Johan, your closing comments? Yeah, I just, I want to say, um, let's not say it's a stupid law. It's, it, it may not be a stupid law, or it may be. We don't know yet because uh, the responsibility rests upon government to explain to us why they've banned the trade of cigarettes and not smoking of cigarettes, like they did, for instance, you know, cocaine or LSD or whatever. The actual possession and, and consumption is illegal. So uh, I, I absolutely agree with, um, uh, with the, 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 the question. Nobody's disputing the health consequences. But when you impose prohibitive bans on, on, a, on a big portion of the population, such as 7 million South Africans, you better have things in place to mitigate the consequences. And that's, I don't see any evidence of that. Lisa? I think you hands hit the nail on the head. Um, you need to, a responsive regulator would foresee um, circumstances like this. Uh, you know, one of my biggest worries is that government said that it needed two weeks to give us reasons why they introduced the ban. And to that, that you know, that to my mind suggests that it's almost as if they were trying to find the evidence um, ex post facto, trying to argue, you know, why they'd introduced the ban in the, in the first place. I think if it had been based on solid science, they should have been able to immediately, uh, you know, give the answer. And then I guess, you know, tongue in cheek, um, I don't think that you can stop smoking today um, and be sufficiently recovered, um, you know, should you be struck down by COVID virus next week. Um, I think, you know, recovery from smoking takes many months, many years. Um, and so in the short term, I can't see that um, it's really, um, you know, the, the best alternative for government to have introduced. Linda, your thoughts? I kind of want to know from Tadita, what's the chance of the court case succeeding? In other words, are, are, are they going to drag it out and eventually at phase, at phase two of lockdown, then, you know, suddenly said, okay, you can buy cigarettes. Well, so the first thing is, I guess, what's really important is we need to know by when we'll get to phase two, because if phase two were just around the corner, um, you know, litigation is extraordinarily expensive. Um, so if I were in Fita's shoes, if, if we knew that phase two was around the corner, I think I would play my cards slightly differently. 
Um, but having said that, I do think that FITA has a very strong chance of success. I've looked at the constitutional law arguments. I've looked at the administrative law arguments. Um, and I actually regret not being a lawyer anymore because this is the kind of case I would have loved to have argued because I'm convinced FITA has a good case. Well, thanks to the two of you and to my co-host Linda van Tilburg for a fascinating hour. We have got many questions which we're going to send to our panelists and uh, ask them to try and respond. I don't know if you've got uh, the, the next few days uh, to just allocate to answering the questions, but if you could pick at least some of them out and respond to some of the business community who have uh, come along to yet another record-breaking attendance at a webinar. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, Linda, um, nice to have you here. We'll be relying on you heavily to pick up on a, a really interesting new subject for next week. But until then, from me, Alec Hogg, and, uh, and all of us here at BizNews and our esteemed panelists, thank you for being with us. Go and buy the books. You. Uh, you can see the book of Talita's there. You've, you've got uh, Johan's books as well. And Kone, uh, Prof, when, uh, when you bring your book out, uh, we'll tell people to buy that <laughs> one. <laughs> but, uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Being with us. Thanks, Alec. Thank you. Thank you.